right, well, I think we're about ready to go. <laughs> this, this is going to be a fun panel. So I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator. Uh, Laura Murphy is an assistant professor of law at Vermont Law School and served as an associate director of the and serves as the associate director of the Environmental and Natural Resource Law Clinic. Um, currently focusing on a variety of Clean Water Act work and agricultural issues. So, Professor Murphy. Thank you. And thank you everyone for sticking around for the grand finale for today. I'm very happy to be introducing this panel. You're going to be hearing about two really hot topics. The first is tile drainage and the second is CAFOs, so it's going to be very interesting. Um, first, you're going to hear about a tile, drains, tile drainage system case that is in Iowa. That case was just filed in January and we're going to have two people talking about that case with you. First, um, Jerry Anderson, who's a professor of law at the Drake University Law School, will be speaking with you. And he also does some public interest lawyering on the side, is that correct? Correct, correct. great. And then um, Mark James will also be speaking about that case. And Mark is an, um, a global energy fellow here in the Institute for Energy and the Environment. And Mark is actually from Canada. He received his JD from the University of uh, Ottawa, is that how you say it? Ottawa. Ottawa, okay. <laughs> Ottawa. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then after that, we're going to hear from um, two attorneys who are actually working on a case about a CAFO out in the state of Washington. First, we will hear from Deb Christensen. Deb is a partner at the law firm Givens Pursley out in Idaho. And she is part of the team that's representing the defendants in that case. After that, we'll hear from Charlie, seated on the very end. He's going to be up on the screen in GoToMeeting. He's out in Eugene, Oregon. And Charlie Tebbit is the founder of the law offices of Charlie Tebbit. And he's part of the team that represents the plaintiffs in that case out in Washington. And I have just a short question that I'll pose for the panelists to be thinking about during the panel. And, and just so you know, because we're starting late, we're going to go maybe till 5.30 or so, so we will have time for questions, um, but we may not go that long, we'll see. Um, but just to be thinking about what is the actual long-term solution for agriculture and waterways? Now, how do we ensure that agriculture does not and will not contaminate waterways? Second part of that question is, assuming there is such a solution, um, how do we get there? And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Anderson. Well, that's, I believe, the first time I've ever heard of anyone discuss uh, tile, tile drainage and say that it was going to be exciting, so uh, I'm not sure that I can live up to that, but um, we, I am from one of those I states, as Matt uh, described them earlier, that were at the top of the, the Chesapeake Bay uh, map, uh, and we're in red, which means that a lot of the problem with the Gulf hypoxia zone comes from our state. And so uh, it was great for me to hear about the Lake Champlain TMDL because uh, it's nice to hear a positive story before turning to uh, the different kind of story that we're going to tell about Iowa where uh, this Des Moines Waterworks lawsuit was filed and the governor uh, said that it was the equivalent of declaring war on farmers. Uh, and so we are engaged in that sort of finger pointing that you heard about in that last panel uh, that they're trying to avoid, where the rural interests are pointing at the urban interests and the urban interests are pointing at the, at the rural interests as being the cause of the problem. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the background of water quality in Iowa, uh, and then Mark's going to get into some of the legal issues involved in this particular lawsuit, which has uh, a lot of promise to be important not only for Iowa, but, but for other uh, areas that are dominated or significantly uh, impacted by agricultural pollution. Uh, so we have a lot of impaired waters in Iowa, and it's always interesting for my students in environmental law class who think that, you know, the polluted states are like New Jersey or, you know, Detroit or some places where all the pollution is. Uh, we have a lot of impaired waters in Iowa. On the last impaired waters list, we had 572 impaired water bodies. If you're not familiar with the geography of our state, uh, we have the Missouri River running down the western side of the, uh, the Mississippi River running down the eastern side of the state. So 
uh, we're in between those two rivers and pretty much everything in, in between is uh, impaired. We have 751 total impairments on the last list and in terms of percentages, in terms of the waters that have been assessed, 80%, uh, if you can read those numbers, 80% of the streams and rivers are impaired uh, or potentially impaired and about uh, 65 67 percent of lakes are impaired and that really understates the problem because as Matt pointed out earlier uh, we don't have numeric nutrient standards in Iowa what, and nutrients are in fact our biggest pollutant in Iowa but yet we don't have numeric standards so uh, if we had numeric standards this list would be a lot worse than it already is so where, where does the problem come from? And this, this slide should be called, we're number one, because we are number one uh, in several things in the agricultural world. We're number one in hogs, and we're number one in corn. Uh, and so if you go to, if you go to Iowa, if, if, if you've ever been through Iowa, 86% of our land base is agriculture. And so you, now the Secretary of Agriculture for Ver Vermont was talking about the 7,000 farms that you have here. We have 86,000, no, 92,000 farms. They added a few since I had this slide. 92,000 farms in Iowa. So agriculture dominates not only the landscape, but also, as you can imagine, the politics of Iowa, which uh, certainly colors this story. Uh, so hogs and corn have a very symbiotic relationship, and on this slide I also have a Grant Wood painting who is also from Iowa, which is something we're also proud of. Um, but hogs and corn have a very symbiotic relationship, as many of you know. Uh, hogs eat corn, and then they produce manure, which corn needs to grow. So corn needs a lot of nitrogen uh, to grow, and so hogs provide a lot of that nitrogen. So farmers uh, love hogs because they can then use the nitrogen on their, on their corn crop. Uh, we also produce a lot of eggs. We're the number one uh, egg producer in the country, although North Carolina goes back and forth with us a little bit, so it depends on the day. Uh, but there are places in Iowa where you have one facility that has six million laying hens in one farm. Six million. We won't go into the animal welfare aspect of that because that's a whole other hour talk that we could have. But uh, there's a lot of guano being produced by those uh, hands, as you can imagine. And then we have soybeans. We're also the number one soybean producer. Why? Because soybeans are, in, are a nitrogen fixer, so they take nitrogen from the air and they put it into the soil. So farmers who grow corn switch off with soybeans because the soybeans then can help them use less fertilizer the next year. But as a result of that, legume fixation uh, causes a lot of the nitrate problem in the waters. So enough of the agricultural um, primer, but the result is that we have a lot of agricultural pollution. Um, and this has already been discussed, so I don't need to go into it, but you know that a lot of it is nutrient-based uh, and causes not only problems for us, but also for the Gulf of Mexico. So, if you take the Raccoon River TMDL, and as uh, Laura mentioned, uh, I've done some uh, public interest law, including the TMDL uh, programmatic lawsuit in Iowa. So, uh, as a result of that suit, uh, the Iowa DNR did this TMDL. And one of the questions that they had is, it's not gonna do any dang good because we know that 90% of the problem is non-point, and we can't do anything about that. And lo and behold, when they did the TMDL for the, night, the Raccoon River, which runs through Des Moines, uh, is impaired by nitrates. Uh, Des Moines gets its drinking water from the, the Raccoon River. They did the TMDL, and 90% comes from non-point source pollution, which I know I'm not supposed to say non-point source. It's supposed to be uncontrolled pollution uh, <laughs> that is currently not regulated as a point source, right? Uh, but in the TMDL, they refer to it as non-point. 85% of that is coming from agricultural land, both in terms of fertilizer and legume fixation. So, um, so it's a lot of our problem is non-point. I'm going to blow through these because you already know about the hypoxia problem. 
we've had probably 15 different people mention it, but you, I just want to want you to remember that the red states up there at the top, where all the hypoxia, well, much of the hypoxia is coming from, includes Iowa. Uh, if you look at that big red area, that's us. So this problem of uncontrolled nutrient um, agricultural pollution is affecting not only us and our drinking water, but also uh, a lot of other people as well. So what is our strategy? What are we doing about it? Well, unlike Vermont, apparently, um, our Department of Natural Resources has really no control over non-point agricultural pollution. Um, and so when they did the TMDL, they, their hands were tied, literally, in not being able to do anything about it. Uh, and so, as Matt can tell you, uh, the, the plan in Iowa uh, is is this, the nutrient redu reduction strategy. We have to reduce our nutrient inputs by 45% uh, of nitrogen and phosphorus. And in order to do that, it says 93% of that is coming from non-point sources, 93%. And so how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do it, with it, we know how to do it. We have, in the nutrient strategy, we have a lot of stuff that could help. For example, you can get farmers to plant cover crops. So after they harvest the corn, which is going on right now in Iowa, uh, if you put a cover crop on, you can reduce nitrogen uh, runoff by 31%. If you um, have uh, a wetland installed to catch the runoff before it gets into the river, that could be a 52% reduction. None of this stuff we can make anyone do. It's all voluntary. So, how much is it going to cost to, to reach that 45% reduction goal? Well, if you, they, they figured that out in this plan as well, uh, and they figure, okay, well, if, and rather than have you read these numbers, I got it summarized here. Basically, it would cost from $1.2 billion to $4 billion of capital investment, and annual costs from $77 million to $1.2 billion. So, here's our plan. It's all voluntary. It's going to cost between one and four billion dollars, and so the legislature uh, approved 22 million dollars in uh, appropriations last year. This year, it went down. So you can see at this point why the Des Moines Water Works is feeling frustrated. Uh, we have. I'm going to talk about this later. We have the world's biggest nitrate removal system in Des Moines. We're very proud of that as well. Um, it is nearing the end of its useful life. It's going to cost uh, $100 million, I think. What, what do I have in there? Um, a lot of million dollars to replace. It costs a lot of money every day to run. It used to be that we were just running it in the summer. Uh, after the spring runoff when we get high nitrate spikes. Now they're running it almost all year round. So we have to do something about it. Bill Stowe, who is this guy right here, is not shy. He's willing to take on the very powerful agricultural interests in Iowa. And so the Des Moines Water Works filed suit uh, against uh, several drainage districts, which uh, Mark will describe, uh, for their pollution of the Raccoon River. Uh, so his stance is basically that we can't wait for this nutrient management strategy to work. It's all voluntary. No money's being appropriated for it. It's another one of those plans like you've had with the hypoxia zone that just kicks the can down the road another 20 years while we wait for something to happen. And so he's trying to make something happen. And the project is, as we've seen with a lot of uh, lawsuits in the Clean Water Act over the years, we know that the point source world is where the control is. So we're trying to move as much into the point source world as we can. So how do we do that? And that's what Mark's going to describe here with the legal aspects of this suit. Very brief story. 
it has a theme that runs right through through the last panel. So the first time I encountered tile drainage, my father was sitting on a backhoe. There's a hole that's six feet deep. There's water that's three feet high, and my rubber boots are about two feet high. And he's telling me to hurry up. So we're at the end of the day. We'll try and hurry up too, so we can get good. Um, and tile drainage is a sexy topic, no matter what you do. So I did want to. I'm going to start with just a case citation. Um, and just going to give a very <coughs> brief history of where we're at. It was filed on March 16th, 2015. It's a Clean Water Act suit. Um, they've already given us an anticipated trial hearing date of August 8th, 2016, and that's the two weeks they set aside to do it. They're in the process of um, expert witnesses. I believe we just heard that they might have filed for uh, summary judgment. So. My Bloomberg alerts hasn't shown me that yet, but three three counties um, in the Raccoon River uh, drainage basin um, and the Des Moines Water Works um, as the plaintiff. So uh, seeking damages and injunctive relief, um, they're doing it under a Clean Water Act suit. They've also filed under for violation of the Iowa uh, state statutory code, um, and they've also have. Uh, some common law cases, <laughs> common law uh, claims of negligence, nuisance, and trespass. Um, but what they're in reading their statement of claim and their statements of defense, you have two opposing views. One, which the waterworks claims it's coming, pollution is coming from groundwater and requires a, an NPDES permit. The drainage district's response is that it's agricultural stormwater runoff. So we have the these two opposing views, and we will, I'll come back to the, the agricultural stormwater runoff issue towards the end of my slides, but we're going to kind of work our way through. If you're going to get, uh, show a violation, an unpermitted discharge, you need to get through your five factors for unpermitted discharges, which is, um, comes from section 301 and section 502 of the Clean Water Act, which is any addition of any pollutant, to navigable waters from any point sourced by any person. Um, show all five elements, an unpermitted discharge, so we can eliminate it by any person. Uh, the drainage districts are a creature of statute. They have the ability to own, manage, supervise property. They can collect fees um, to navigable waters. There's already uh, a TMDL for the Raccoon River for the where the pollution is coming um, of any pollutant. So the, the number that you'll keep coming, we'll keep coming back to is uh, 10 milligrams per liter of nitrates, and that's the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, limit for what you can send out in drinking water and what's causing uh, the waterworks to run their denitrification plant uh, far more than they had anticipated doing. Um, and then we come to the final two, which is any addition from any point source. So uh, doing a quick look at that, just to go back so that you can Envision what tile drainage is. Um, I have tile drainage 101 and tile drainage 102 is coming up. <laughs> so, tile drainage, if you, you think about it being a tile, that's how it used to be. Um, I've seen it before, it used to be clay tiles, and you line them, they're 18 inches long, and you line them up and uh, put them in a row. But the, now it's 500 foot rolls of perforated plastic pipe. You run them. 20 to 30 feet apart, they come down, they connect into a header tile, eventually it ends up into a ditch, which then goes on to a creek, and goes on to a stream, and keeps moving its way uh, downstream. And what you get is tile drainage 102. They can really try and accomplish two goals. They can be seeking to move uh, surface water, just to prevent the water from building up on the surface, or they can keep the water table from rising. Um, in this case, in Iowa, what they're trying to do is keep the water table from rising up, so it creates a root zone um, where all the corn and all the soybeans and everything else can grow in, allows them to be oxygenated. Um, so it's not trying to remove excess surface water, but it's trying to keep the water table from coming up too high. So are they, isn't an addition, um, looking at what are the, so what do they need to show? Um, is the pollutant in the water, and would it get there on its own? Uh, and this is, a, this is the historic concentration starting, the years are hard to see, but it starts in 1974 and runs through to 2012. Um, so, this is the magic number of 10. 
Um, and you can see that there's a gradual increase, but a lot more spikes in concentration, which is what's causing the, the water work to have to run the plant. And one of the neat things, one of the good things, is that because this has been a long identified problem, it's been a long study problem, um, and there's money out there for people to do it, and you can actually go online, and this is the current concentrations from last week. Um, the USGS uh, maintains these records, and the magic number of 10, uh, somewhere down there, because um, it's currently running, that's 14, um, we come up to 15 here. So this was the, the concentrations from the middle Raccoon River um, at Peoria. So you see that there are, are lots of, there are problems within the whole base of it. So now you know that there's nitrates in the water, you have to figure out where they're coming from and we come back to pile drains are just the little white dots that get hanging out here, um, connecting everything, all of that subsurface network. Um, and what they've actually done in their statement of claim is they've gone through and done sample sites. So nine sample sites in the three drainage districts on four sample days, July, September, October, and December, this is the 2014, um, and nitrate concentrations ranging anywhere from almost 13 up to almost 38 milligrams per liter, which, once again, much higher than the magic number of 10 milligrams per liter. And the timing of those measurements is lining up with concentration spikes at the water treatment plant. Um, and then one of the things that Jerry did mention that they're running the, the denitrification plant more and more, and now it runs sort of 25% like of the time it was anticipated just to come online and be a, a temporary uh, solution to um, specific times of the year when they would see spikes during the spring. Um, and they'd also see spikes during the fall whenever you were past your growing season and you're still having uh, taking amounts of water coming off the land. So, would it get there on its own? Um, pile drains speed up the water movement by about a factor of two, which shortens your residency period. It's just moving groundwater faster. When it moves groundwater faster, it's moving more of it. Um, and the streams in this area are receiving the majority of their yearly discharge from groundwater, um, which when we get to the agriculture stormwater uh, runoff exemption is an important thing we're gonna discuss. So I think I actually have these two out of line, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about them in this order. Um, so point source, so it, we know that the, they can come down and they've done the end of the pipe measurements. And we come back to, all right, we have a, a point source. Um, so I've highlighted some of the, the key terms here, which are pipe, ditch, channel, tunnel. This is pipe running underneath the ground. It's coming out into ditches, coming out, moving through channels. Um, and then the very important exclusions at the bottom of agriculture, stormwater discharge, and return flows from agriculture. Um, this is just a, a separate point here, just a couple of pages. So, point source is not required to be the original source of the pollutant, only that it conveys the pollutant. Because you're dealing with a mix of drainage district owned, um, <coughs> it's ditches or tiles, but they're also connecting onto privately owned um, tileage systems. So, they are moving, they are the end point that's going to come out and do the discharge, but it's coming off of private land um, where those landowners have invested in the tile drainage and the maintenance of that tile drainage, and that comes from the Nikosuke case, and I'm not sure if this is, the next case is something that Professor Tucholsky um, litigated, and it's actually, it's connected in, it's a groundwater discharge case, although it, it focused on what was a pollutant, it was dealing with coal bed, meth coal bed methane, and uh, the discharge in that, what they were doing was pumping uh, groundwater into a, a river and then, so they're, but they're not doing any additional alteration, which is what you can say is happening here in Iowa as well, that they're simply moving the water from the land uh, and it, whether or not it would have reached that now the water, but the discharge. There's also an interesting point in the statement of claim, they're not saying it's not just doing any additional alteration, so it's uh, man induced, but they're also asserting that it can be man-made. The fact that they had pulled the water table down has brought oxygen into the soil, which increases the nitrification rates. So not only are they moving uh, more nitrates just by speeding up uh, the groundwater flow by exposing the soil to uh, exposing the soil to oxygen, they're also creating 
the opportunity to create additional nitrates, and that's it's in it's something that will need to be it's a claim that will need to be fleshed out through uh, many many expert witnesses with many many dollars. Um, so we're going to go quickly through point source exemptions, um, agricultural stormwater runoff, return flows from ir irrigated agriculture. Um, so the Clean Water Act doesn't have a definition, doesn't define agricultural stormwater runoff, so it's really been defined through case law, um, and these are three key agricultural stormwater cases, all dealing with CAFOs. Uh, first one is Southview Farms, um, and is there a connection between the discharge, is the discharge a result of precipitation? And it's not that it happens at the same time as a precipitation event, that it is the result of a precipitation event. Um, Waterkeeper, uh, the Waterkeeper case talks about uh, land use application, um, and the exemption applies if you have appropriate agricultural utilization and the use of site-specific nutrient management plans. And then the last case um, in all um, is refining the agricultural purpose uh, definition, and if it's related to agriculture, it can be outside of uh, land-based application, although it's not a production area, it can be other areas as well. Um, almost at the end. Um, and I did want to return to the irrigated return flow because they, this is a, a recent case that actually dealt with a tile drainage, but it was for the purpose of removing water that had been applied um, for irrigation purposes. Um, and it's, it's the only reason for the project, this is a case from California, um, out in the uh, San Luis uh, drainage area near Fresno. Um, and it comes down to it's discharges from irrigated agriculture that do not contain additional <coughs> discharges unrelated to crop production. The exemption covers that. Um, so then we'll come back and we'll end with my favorite picture. Um, so it's a summary kind of, of what we know and, and what they're going to have to talk about. So we know that water flowing across the top of the, of the soil, agriculture stormwater runoff. There's a Professor Owens had a Throw had a picture in his uh, presentation earlier this morning. You can, when you see water sheeting off and you get gully. We know the water coming from uh, discharge from groundwater. That there's case law showing that that requires an NPDES permit, especially if you are moving it um, when it would not have otherwise been connected. And what we have is this magical mystery area in here, where one you have a claim that there are creating more nitrates in those areas, and two, where does agricultural stormwater, which moves across the top, become groundwater, um, which could be subject to a, a permit? Um, does it need to connect to the water table? Is there a residency period? Um, what kind of latency stuff uh, is involved with that? What's an appropriate agricultural utilization? Once again, if you're creating um, nitrates in that area, and if you're putting on fertilizers that are at rates that are not or that are above what's required for plant growth, um, all sorts of fun cases that uh, lawyers would argue in depositions and do uh, all sorts of interesting work. I look forward to looking at. So I'm now going to turn it back over to Professor Anderson to take us home. Okay. So you, you may not have heard of tile. Uh, drainage before. Uh, if you, in Iowa, it really stems from our uh, history in terms of the glacial period. Uh, the glaciers came down to about Des Moines and then retreated back, and as a result, uh, the geology of the area is such that uh, you really, in this part of Iowa, uh, where these red areas are, uh, and so that you can see how it matches up there, uh, it's basically the upper reaches of the raccoon watershed you have, to tie, you have to tile your land or you can't farm it. Uh, it's about, Iowa used to be about 90% covered by wetlands and about 90% of those have now been converted to cropland. So uh, it basically has to be drained in order to, um, in order to, for you to farm it. And so in this area of this watershed, you can see that it's about 70, in the purple parts, 77% uh, of, the, of the land is drained by time. So if you can control that, and if, you, and if DNR can now treat those as point source discharges, 
you will have covered a lot of the pollution that's coming into the Raccoon River. And on down the Raccoon River, it goes down to the Mississippi River. Uh, and so it's a, it's a big part of, of the issue. Uh, so the question is then, um, what is the possible outcome of the suit and what uh, are the possible solutions? And we've already, you've already talked about these, so, but they are in particularly important for us because we don't require any of these things now. Uh, and so setback requirements, right now farmers can farm to the edge of their field, uh, to the edge of the water. Uh, no buffer strip, strip requirement in Iowa. Um, no cover crop requirements. No, we do have one restriction, which is you can't put manure on frozen ground in the winter, unless you get an exemption. You could get an exemption if your manure pit is too full, but uh, that's the only one we have. If you put manure on frozen ground, then when it thaws, you know where it's going to go, right? So, uh, so we do have that one. But other than that, we don't have any uh, manure integration requirements and so on. And so the answers re would require things like that. Constructed wetlands will take nitrogen out of the water as well. So if you look at a place like Minnesota, they have restrictions. Um, they have setback requirements. They have uh, requirements that protect tile intakes from being too polluted. Um, and they have uh, buffer strip requirements. They also have a lot of funding. So they have a 3 eighths of a cent sales tax that is then available for farmers to use if they have a project. So they, they really have <coughs> both the carrot and the stick here uh, involved. Um, so, and we just heard about Vermont's requirements that are now even being strengthened. And so we always look at Vermont and Minnesota as examples of what Iowa needs to do. But the difference, I think, politically, is that in your state and in Minnesota, remember Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes. They have a lot of recreation uh, there, and a lot of their economy depends on recreation. You don't have a lot of people coming to Iowa to, to go fishing. Um, that's not a big part of our, uh, of our economy. And so uh, it's not as big of a, uh, a block at the Capitol as it would be here. We also have um, some innovative techniques that are being tried. Wood chip bioreactors, if you send this tile uh, line discharge through a wood chip uh, field, the wood chips will take the nitrates out before it gets to the water. But that's obviously a much more expensive solution um, than some of the others, but that is a technology-based solution. So uh, a lot of the farmers are very, very, uh, concerned about this, and of course the Farm Bureau is, is helping to generate that fear. Um, but the, the, even if the Des Moines Water Works is successful, we're not talking about individual farmers having to get NIPTES permits. We're talking about the counties who run the drainage districts having to get a permit. And that permit could be a regional permit, it could be a general permit, it doesn't have to be an individual permit. So uh, just because we, if, the waterworks is successful to move these into the point source world, it doesn't mean that every farmer is going to have to get a permit for their tie line at all. Um, and then the question will be, what will be the technology-based standards or the water quality-based standards that uh, DNR would enforce on the drainage district? That, that remains an open question as well. It's my hope that, you know, and I don't think anyone thinks that this lawsuit is the best way to handle the problem. Even Bill Stowe. Uh, the Waterworks Director doesn't think it's the best way to handle the problem. We all wish that the Iowa Legislature would say, you know, let's adopt the sort of standards that Minnesota has, let's authorize the three-eighths three of a uh, cent sales tax and get some money available to install wetlands along these streams. Uh, let's handle it that way. But at the moment, it's the only, you have to, you have to use the, 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 uh, the battlefield that's presented. So. Uh, I don't know if that's the right metaphor. You have to fight on the battlefield that's in front of you. I don't know what it is. But anyway, what I'm saying is that this is, this is the only option right now because the legislature is not interested in doing anything. Uh, and so this hopefully will move people off the dime uh, to talk about what we can do about this problem, not only for us, but for the Gulf of Mexico as well. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I've been here since 8 o'clock, so I feel pretty lucky that I get to talk to you now, and it's almost 5 o'clock. And so um, thanks for having me. I'm Deb Christensen. I came in from Boise, Idaho, and I sure do love Vermont. I've had a day and a half to kind of explore your part of the world, and I feel real happy. Um, not only am I lucky because I get to be one of the last speakers after being here all day, but much like Richard Schwartz, who was earlier, I get to talk about a case that I lost, and my um, opposing counsel gets to follow me, so I'm feeling super lucky. <laughs> Good day for me, right? Um, as I said, I'm Deb Christensen. Um, I'm from Boise, and I've had the honor of representing a number of dairymen in Yakima, Washington. Um, and I'm going to be talking to today quickly, I promise, because I've been here just like you have all day, um, about the cases that we've been involved with in over in Yakima. And this is kind of an overview of some of the things I'm going to quickly touch on as we make our way through this today. Uh, before I go on, I'm making sure you're all alive and out there still. It's 5 o'clock. How many of you know where Yakima, Washington is? Raise your hand. Oh, good. There's at least half of you. That's more than um, people even in Idaho, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and we're a lot closer. So um, uh, these cases that we're talking about came out of Yakima, the Yakima Valley. And that, there's a quick little map to show you where it is. It's kind of right in the middle of the state. If you know anything about Seattle and the west side of the state, what do you know? It rains a lot, right? They drink a lot of coffee. It's wet. The other side of the state is exactly the opposite. It's very dry. And Yakima is on the drier side of the state. It's on the east side of the state. They get about eight inches of rain per year. The valley itself has a really long history of agriculture. Um, Washington is the number one producer of apples, you may have known that, of cherries and pears in the United States. Um, and Yakima County is the number one producer of apples in Washington. So there's a lot of ag going on in there. Tree fruit is a big deal. Um, and more close, near and dear to my heart, it's a rapidly expanding beer and wine region in, in, in the uh, Yakima Valley. It's been used um, for agriculture for many years. Most of the irrigation early on was, uh, uh, was just flood irrigation. So there was, you know, they put water on it, it seeped down, too much water it go through, but for many, many years it was doing that. The last 30 years or so they moved away from that. Um, animal agriculture has been in the valley since the late 1800s. Um, dairies, um, have, but cattle was first uh, in the valley in the 1850s, and uh, dairies uh, started really expanding their operations in the late 1970s. Uh, the dairies in all of Washington state are all regulated under dairy <coughs> nutrient management plans and NRCS standards. This is a really quick, just visual of the Yakima Valley, and I know no one can read that. Even if you were up close, you'd have a hard time reading that. The red are the municipalities. That's marks where the actual cities are in the valleys. The yellow marks nitrate concentrations in various um, levels from 1990 to 2000, and then the green shows you nitrate concentrations from 2001 to 2010, and I just show you that to show you that there are nitrates throughout this valley, not just in agricultural land, but spread out through the entire valley. Is that surface water, nitrates, or groundwater? Groundwater. The, um, there have been, um, and what that, that shows you is there's been nitrates above the exceedance of 10 MCLs for nitrates in groundwater for a long period of time. Um, and what has led to these lawsuits were um, a number of consent orders, and the EPA obviously paying attention to the valley, saying, what are we doing about nitrates in groundwater in the Yakima Valley? Um, and uh, one of the things that EPA did was um, approach a number of dairies and have them enter into consent orders. And this is how we got there. Starting in 2008, the local newspaper, the Yakima Herald, ran a number of stories about nitrates in groundwater and their potential effects on human health. Um, a year later, the EPA designated the Yakima Valley as an environmental justice showcase, and with that came money. And a study was done then in the Yakima Valley looking at nitrates and groundwater, and that study is what started pointing the finger at the dairymen that I now represent, or have represented, starting in 2013. During the period when EPA was looking at nitrates and groundwater, they approached the dairymen that I end up ultimately representing, and saying, look, we think you're, the, you're, we think you're um, at fault here, and we are going to come after you and enforce um, the provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act unless you agree to 
you know, enter into consent order, the voluntary, voluntary consent order. Um, I did not represent these dairymen during that period. They had other outside counsel, but over the course of a year or so, uh, a number of dairies did agree to enter into um, consent orders with the EPA with the hopes of alleviating whatever problems and issues that they had and that they could address those with the EPA and move forward and potentially avoid litigation. I know you can't see the very top of that slide because of that, um, but the specific dairies that were involved were um, four different families representing five different dairy operations. Um, Cow Palace is a name that you might have heard of or seen. Um, that was uh, run and has been run by a family called the Dolsons. Um, that was the lead case out of a, it started off as five separate cases and ultimately we ended up with three cases. I'll tell you how we got there. Uh, but the three families at issues were the Dolsons, the Rooters, the Bosmas, and the Hawks. Um, all, each one of the dairies that were subject to the consent order with the EPA had been subject to and had dairy nutrient management plans with the Washington State Department of Ag, and all have been subject to regular inspections by the Department of Ag. Um, as you can see, of the five dairies that were at issue, four of them entered into the consent order. The fifth one, the Hawk Dairy, did not. They just, at the time, they just, they were a much smaller operation, and I'll show you a map in a second. They were physically separate. They just couldn't afford to enter into it and to, to continue doing that. Um, as I mentioned, the EPA's consent order was predicated on um, the emergency provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And some of you may remember that, but given the lateness of the day, I'll tell you what Section 1431 says is in order for the EPA to act under these circumstances, they must, um, they have authority to act where one, a contaminant is present in underground drinking water supply, two, the contaminant may present an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health, and three, state and local authorities have not acted to protect public health. When those situations have been met, the emergency provisions of 1431 apply and the EPA can act. That's what they moved under. Here's a picture of the dairies um, that were ultimately involved. Um, and as you can see, those are all physically close to one another. If I have a red, do I have a dot? If I had the hot dairy, they'd be up here. So this, the, in the red right there, is Liberty. I can't even read my own. Liberty, Vlasma, this is Cow Palace. And these are the rooters back and forth. This is some of the dairy. So Hawks would have been over here. That's the one that didn't enter into the consent order with the EPA. They were a much smaller operation, and they were physically separate from them. So I'm just telling you that because they're a little bit different than the other ones. What's the square mile um, grid on that? Square mile? Um, are you talking it, about how many... Cows and how many square miles do we have here? This is each each of these facilities has somewhere between five and eight thousand, four or eight thousand cows. The Deruders are two different facilities, lower up here and up here. See these? They're spread out. Um, I don't have the. It you could walk it. It's it's not ten miles, but it's probably maybe here to here is a mile. I can't see the. I didn't anticipate that question, that's, that's sorry. That's two miles right there, so it's all right. that's two miles right there. There you go. So two by two, th two by three up and down. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not going to go through all the different um, requirements of the EPA consent order that the dairies enter into, but um, they were significant and are significant because the EPA order is still in effect. And it includes providing alternative drinking water sources, installation of a, a series of groundwater monitoring wells with quarterly sampling, um, uh, soil sampling, um, assessing all the lagoons. Each one of these facilities had a number of lagoons that um, were built under the auspices of the NRCS standards. Uh, there was an issue about, uh, you know, it's built from starting in the 70s all the way through the present and what kind of paperwork did anybody have to prove how compliant or not compliant they were when they were built was one of the issues in the case. Uh, we allege that they were all built to NRCS standards. Some of the paperwork was not available, and ultimately I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, but NRCS has standards, national standards, for how li liquid manure can be stored in different um, lagoons. 
It's 1 times 10 to the minus 6 is the permeability standard. You get another order of magnitude with a manure seal. I know way too much about manure than I ever knew, but in any event, those are the standards that NRCS has established. A number of uh, detailed plans, both irrigation water and field application plans, um, were required to be uh, produced and had been produced. Um, an agronomist was hired by each of these to follow specific guidelines in terms of field applications. Um, and it was an eight-year timeline with the potential of going longer if certain goals were not met. So that was what the EPA and each of the dairies entered into. Um, and that's what our dairymen enter to, thinking this is bad, but in terms of, oh my gosh, we got all these new requirements, but okay, we know what the deal is. We can put our hands around what is required of us, let's move forward. Not yet. Um, RICRA, and this is why I'm on the cutting edge litigation panel, is because you, we've been talking about Clean Water Act all day, right? You haven't been talking about RICRA, because RICRA has not traditionally been applied to uh, animal agriculture. So a quick little primer on that. RICRA um, is under the Solid Waste Disposal Act. It's a comprehensive environmental statute intended to address the nation's industrial wastes. RICRA regulates two types of wastes, hazardous wastes and solid wastes. And then solid waste is defined as any garbage, refuge, and any discarded material. And you can see the rest of it, including uh, things from animal op agricultural operations. Discarded is the key phrase there. Discarded material is not <coughs> defined in RICRA, but courts dealing with this have held that a substance is discarded where it is disposed of, thrown away, or abandoned. So those are kind of the key words to keep in mind as we talk about RICRA. A quick look at the legislative history of RICRA. When it was enacted in 76, the legislative history made it clear that agricultural wastes that are, quote, returned to the soil as fertilizers or soil conditioners are not considered discarded under RICRA. Uh, for almost 40 years, EPA never brought a RICRA action against an animal um, an agricultural operation alleging that its manure constituted solid wastes. And at least one case in Oklahoma, a Tyson Foods case involving chicken litter, um, where uh, <laughs> allegations were made that the chicken litter falls within the solid waste definition of RICRA were, were um, dismissed at the motion to dismiss case. So that's, that's what's leading up to. We've, the dairies have entered into this EPA consent order. This is the history of RICRA. Um, you'll hear from Charlie, and he'll tell you why he decided to go this way. I'm sure he's chomping at the bit. Um, uh, but um, Charlie represented uh, two different environmental groups, a local group and a national group, and they filed notices of intent to sue in October. This is before the uh, EPA study was actually finalized, although versions of it had been out. In February of 2013, went ahead and filed the five separate but identical RICRA citizen suits in the Eastern District of Washington, in federal court there, and it was assigned to a relatively newly appointed judge, Judge Tom Rice. And basically the allegations were that, that the manner in which each of the dairies used, handled, and stored its manure constituted um, a violation of RICRA's bar against open dumping, and that posed an imminent and substantial endangerment to health and the environment. And the specific allegations, and I'm boiling it down because it could get very complicated, but the big, big ones that we can get at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday were that the liquid that was stored in NRCS compliant, even if they're compliant lagoons, they're designed to leak. That was the allegation, that even if you meet the NRCS standards, because there's some permeability and something gets through there by design, and that's what the standards call for, that's a discarded material and you're not gonna use that, and that's a violation of, of RICRA. The other allegation was when dairies over-apply manure, that is, they take their manure and apply it to the crops, and all of it is not, not used by those crops, and there's residual left in the soil, that that too, is that over-application is a discard. You're not using it. Those are the allegations made under RICRA. The litigation uh, uh, began in earnest, and uh, was um, uh, active, let's put it that way, it was very active. Um, we brought, the defendants brought a motion to dismiss, um, arguing that it was, uh, that the lawsuits were duplicative and inconsistent with the EPA's consent orders, that those activities and substance had already been addressed by EPA, and they did not need to be brought 
um, uh, under this provision, uh, under any environmental provision, the, the EPA has already acted on those specific activities and substantives, uh, substances, and that more substantively, that animal manure was not a solid waste under RCRA. Uh, the judge denied that and said, no, I think it's an issue of fact. We're going to see um, how this plays out. We're, I'm going to let this case go forward. That fifth case, the hot case, the guys that were over here, they ended up settling out because they ended up going out of business. They couldn't afford to, they couldn't afford to fight the consent order. They certainly couldn't afford to, to fight this. They sold their cows. They were no longer in business and were able to come to a settlement and get them out. But we were left then with those four families that were more contiguous. Extensive discovery went on. And now remember, we have the consent order in place with the EPA. So all this soil testing, all this water testing that the EPA is doing under the consent order is being generated all during this time and being provided to the plaintiffs. And then additional discovery was done, including under Rule 34, Federal Rule 34, where plaintiffs came on site and did uh, additional testing. Um, the two of the cases by the same family were consolidated. And interestingly, the plaintiffs added, near the end of the case, um, third party landowners or entities that our dairies um, lease land from to apply their manure. Two that were, that were associated with the dairies, and they were added as defendants to this case as well. A summary judgment was filed in case number one, which was the cow palace. These cases were staggered to go to trial, one behind each other. Now, they all have the same theories, but you can imagine each operation has distinct ways of operating, and who knows what their soil and water samples would be. I mean, they're a lot alike, but they're also different in substantial ways. First case to go was cow palace. Um, Judge Rice issued a decision on January 14th, and he was the first judge in the country to find that animal manure is in fact, or can in fact be found to be a solid waste under RCRA. His specific holdings are summarized here, and I, I know I'm going fast, but there's a lot, that he did accept the plaintiff's contentions and the arguments made that the manure was over applied to crops is a discard under RCRA. That manure which escapes from NRCS compliant lagoons is a discard because those lagoons were, quote, designed to leave. And uh, manure that was com composted on native unlined soil constituted discard because some of it could get through the soils. Um, what he left for issues of fact were, um, oh, and he also said that third party landowners could be liable under RCRA. And then what he left for issues of fact were um, whether or not when cows, as somebody said earlier, pee and poop, um, in their pens, whether that constitutes a discard under RCRA, that was an issue of trial for trial, if there was any surface water impacts and any remediation efforts. Because of that, he then set all three cases for a consolidated trial on May 11th. Yeah. So, look what we did. We have a global settlement. All the dairies um, signed a settlement agreement, and there's the date, which um, which sets forth a number of additional measures that each of them are going to be taking um, to mitigate any environmental impacts from their operation. The intent was to roll those requirements into the existing EPA consent orders and have EPA um, implement and enforce it so that, that we can continue on. We didn't want to get sideways with EPA by settling with plaintiffs, but we wanted to be able to you know, have something that made some sense. You can see a number of additional um, things were um, agreed to, including, look at the lagoons, uh, double lining the lagoons, um, and I'll come back to this because this is something that EPA has to sign off on, and even though we agreed to this in the settlement, we're still subject to EPA, and there's been fighting and fighting and fighting about that. Um, we agreed to put up to a number, uh, a number of new wells in, and then some of you might know about all these cutting edge technologies that are out there about um, environmental, um, ways to protect the environment at dairies. Uh, at the Cow Palace, they um, agreed to put into a, a centrifuge manure separator. Um, at Deruder, it's a dissolved air flotation system. Um, we have, um, we already had in place uh, a number of um, other things going on, but this is just quickly telling you we've got lots going on here. Yeah. Um, but this is probably, we're talking about numbers. Everybody's talking about we want numbers, 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 numbers. This is where numbers came in. If you look at this, and this is with respect to the field applications. If you could look at the newer applications and the numbers that were agreed to for the goals, the 40 number for phosphorus um, in the top foot, in the residual nit 
nitrate plus ammonium, 25 parts per million in the top two feet. That's a big deal. Those are, those are, those are numbers that um, uh, we believe we can get to through the following uh, an agronomist um, uh, instructions. But everybody's talking today about how numbers matter. These are the numbers that came out through the settlement. And just quickly, impacts beyond Yakima, who knows? As somebody said earlier as well, um, the Cow Palace is the only one that had a summary judgment case. It wasn't gone up appeal. The other ones didn't have any decisions. Obviously, they have unique facts given the EPA consent order. Um, and I am sure Charlie will tell you what he thinks are the impacts beyond Yakima. So I went fast, but there was a lot to cover. Thank you, guys. Bringing Charlie to you right now. <laughs> I'm ready. All right, we're just making you bigger. <laughs> Good luck with that. Hey, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. Yeah. Show us your feet. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> what, what have you got on your feet? Um, you really want to know? I've been out in the manure fields today. <laughs> okay, so you're now the presenter, Charlie, so you can share your presentation with us. Okay, do you see my presentation now? No. Wait. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yep. All right. So am I going to be able to click through it and have it come up? Oh, oh, sorry. Hold on for one second. Click the wrong button. Where are you, Charlie? Still here. Sorry. <laughs> the cursor isn't very good. There we go. Okay. If you just like play your presentation, I think it should include this up. All right. Are you going to switch the camera so I can see the crowd? Yes. I don't want to look at my ugly face the whole time. Can you see us, Charlie? Not yet. All right, well, first up, uh, I just want to point out that there are a couple of good news stories. Uh, they're about five minutes long each um, that are available at these links. Uh, you can also link to them at my website, which, uh, let's see, is that here? That's here too, I think. Yeah, key documents are available on my website, uh, which is cited in the panel that you just saw. Uh, let's see, there we go, that one. Is that working? The public awareness of the pollution problem, do you see that? No, I, I think it's on your, uh, do you have both your screens going? Yeah, perhaps, maybe that's the problem though. Huh? All right, let me, let me try, to, uh, try to adjust this so that they only do one thing. Let's see. There you go, you're pulling it into focus now. All right, can you see that now? All right. There you go. Now we got it. All right. So anyhow, uh, these two uh, news stories do a good job. One is of the larger problem in the state of Washington, and the other is um, the one about the Yakima stories uh, that came out in June of 2015. You'll get a really good view of, of the facilities. And just a few things, um, Cow Palace has about 11,000 animals, not 4 to 8,000. Um, EPA, uh, this is just a, a few things that Deb talked about. EPA actually did bring a RICRA imminent substantial endangerment case against a CAFO in Oklahoma, it was the Seaboard case, uh, about 10 years ago. Um, one other just background piece, 
is that um, NRCS standards that were discussed for the lagoons are actually not standards but guidelines. And they're not uh, set based on environmental protection or sound science, but mere politics. So Deb went through the cases a little bit, um, and Charlie, there they are. Charlie? Uh, yes? Could you um, do your PowerPoint in slideshow mode? Boy, I don't know. All right, don't yeah. worry about it if you can. But... Uh, just a second here. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> okay, so does that work? Is that working now? Well, <laughs> there we go. It's coming up? That's yeah. good, that's great. All right. Um, so those are the cases. The liability decision really boiled down to a few things. Um, that the, the dairies did not comply with their dairy nutrient management plans in the least. They, in fact, ignored them. And the court made extensive findings of fact uh, about that. Um, had they complied with the dairy nutrient management plans, they probably, they would have been far more protective of the environment. Uh, but the dairy nutrient management plans, uh, for anyone who's ever seen them, are just uh, cookie cutter, rubber stamp type of um, plans that really are ineffective. Uh, they will be updated uh, in the future if not made uh, superfluous. Um, but the, the court did find that the facilities did apply manure untethered to the DNMP. Um, the court also found, as we alleged in our complaint, that all the lagoons are designed to leak. The NRCS standards are not protective of human health and the environment. And that was a key finding, because that basically means that every earthen lagoon that is built in this United States is, fails to protect human health and the environment. Um, that's a huge point in this case. It was one of the central features that we wanted to prove, because we have said that to the regulatory agencies now for decades, and they've just ignored it, that uh, alarmingly simple scientific proposition. It's um, just, it's amazing that it's been ignored this long. Um, uh, as for composting facilities, they composted, each facility had 40 to 50 acres of compost areas for the hundreds of millions of pounds of manure that each produces every year. Um, and those compost areas were found to be contaminating the water uh, as far down as we've looked. Uh, we went down 20 feet at the Cow Palace compost area and found ammonia levels at about 1,000 parts per million and 15 feet below the surface of the ground. So it hadn't even converted to nitrate yet. Um, the court also found that there were significant impacts, uh, likely significant impacts to human health. And the court said, essentially, uh, I, I paraphrase this, this isn't exactly what uh, the court said, but we don't have to wait for a dead baby to find uh, that there's a, a ma major problem. Uh, Methemoglobinemia, or blue baby syndrome, is one of the effects of uh, nitrate poisoning uh, for small uh, children. And uh, while there was no evidence that uh, anyone had died of blue baby syndrome in the Acoma Valley, um, the court said we don't need to wait for someone to die in order to impose liability and to bring about changes. Um, the court also found that because there was an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health, there was, of course, one to the environment more generally. We have, uh, through extensive expert reports, we had over 200 page expert reports from our two key experts analyzing thousands and thousands of pages of data, soil tests, uh, application records. Um, some of the application records had been destroyed during litigation, so there were claims of spoliation as well. Uh, we never got to those issues because we settled right before trial. Um, but these numbers that you see on the screen were the amounts of manure that were applied after it was determined 
if they had, if the dairies had even looked at their own soil tests, how much manure was applied after the fields were determined not to need any more. And the court found Mr. Boyvin, strangely, you cannot create this stuff. Fact is stranger than fiction. Mr. Boyvin's declaration, he was the manager of Cow Palace, it was clear that he was characterizing his practices as engaging in a series of calculations is a stretch. And that was an understatement at best. As part of the defense during deposition, it became apparent that the experts for the dairies hadn't had all the information in front of them. So they didn't have information such as groundwater temperature data or groundwater fluctuation data and certain other types of things like soil tests and application records. They didn't have the full set of information in front of them. And so when one of their experts was provided with that information, my associate Dan Snyder got to do what very few people get to do in their entire careers. And that was to get an opposing expert to admit some fundamental building blocks of the case. And that is that Cow Palace was more likely than not to be a cause or contributor to the contamination. It doesn't have to be the cause of the contamination, just a contributor. And so the second so-called expert for the defendants from Wisconsin talked about some theory that there was an ancient nitrate plume in the area that he had gleaned from Dr. Melvin's 1968, I think it was, dissertation, the other expert, of finding some nitrate plume in the middle of the desert in Israel or something like that. He then opined after he had done his expert report and during deposition that he came up with the new theory the night before his deposition. And it was after he had had dinner with Deb and the Dulsons the night before. And he did indeed discuss it with them the night before. And he came up with his hallelujah theory. And this is what the deposition transcript reflects, sort of a synopsis of that moment. The critical pieces of the case were that the defense experts ultimately did not disagree with the opinions expressed by plaintiff's experts. And in fact, did agree with some of the fundamental tenets of the plaintiff's case during deposition. And so the court was able to grant summary judgment based on those facts. Normally, you'd have to go to trial on those situations. But even the defendant's experts had to admit some fundamental background science issues that really were incontrovertible. And the judge fortunately found that way and saved us all lots of time and money in going to trial. One other curious thing was that the defendants moved to strike the EPA report that had been done over a two plus year period at something like 3,300 groundwater monitoring tests and came to the conclusion that the dairies were a substantial part of the contribution. Not the sole contribution. That was never an issue. And the plaintiffs never argued that the dairies were the sole contributor to the groundwater contamination, just that they were the predominant one. Even the EPA study indicated that about 60 or so percent of the contamination was coming from the dairies. And particularly with what we call the cluster dairies, Bosma, Cow Palace, and the Derudas. These particular dairies in our expert reports, which by the way are available on my website, 
indicated that the loadings of nitrogen in that specific area were in excess of 99% of what the loading possibilities were in the area because there were only a handful of homes that had septic tanks that could have contributed. There were no municipal dischargers or industrial dischargers around that could have contributed. So there was really not much of a question. And so the remedy is the consent decree, and they do not expire in five years, as Deb indicated. They will expire potentially when the groundwater levels get below 10 parts per million, and that could be decades. So the remedies are agreed to double-lined lagoons. Those are synthetic liners or geomembrane composite liners with leak detection systems, and this is the first time in the country that I'm aware of where a facility is required to have double-lined lagoons with leak detection systems at a CAFO, and that's pretty close to the hazardous waste standard for hazardous waste disposal under RCRA. Deb also pointed out that the... Charlie? Yes. Sorry, you've got two minutes left. All right, perfect. The reductions that EPA had sought down to 45 parts per million, which were more in the guideline realm than absolute, now have to be reduced to 25 parts per million residual nitrate and ammonium combined, and 40 parts per million phosphorus over time. They will change their compost and pen operations. Deb discussed some of that. And the area for which people will be entitled to alternative water if their wells test at over 10 parts per million nitrate is extended from one mile to three miles, so hundreds more people potentially eligible for free alternative water, and that's a huge part of this case. That's what my clients wanted from the start, is they wanted people to be able to drink safe water. One of the other provisions in this is that if someone's well is contaminated at over 60 parts per million nitrate and they have a reverse osmosis system, they are still also entitled to bottled water because a reverse osmosis system generally isn't effective when you get numbers above 60 parts per million. And we had some of the wells on the dairy's properties showing hundreds of parts per million, in one case 230 parts per million, at about a 40-foot depth. One of the provisions of the consent decree is EPA oversight, and we are still negotiating with dairies and EPA as to how that oversight will work. We are doing that now, and we will rewrite the administrative order on consent between EPA and the dairies to incorporate the terms of the consent decree and essentially make one document. One of our experts, actually in support of our fee petition, talked about the national impact of the case. You know, in the older days, and even still in some places, smaller dairies averaged 2.5 to 5 acres per cow. Now we're at, you know, 2.5 to 5 cows per acre. In the Cow Palace case, they only own about, I think it was about 1,000 acres of land, yet they have over 11,000 animals. So there's a 10 to 1 ratio. And that's just not sustainable. Charlie, you're at time if you want to wrap up. Yep. Again, a little more national impact. Dr. Russell is at the University of Minnesota. He worked for the USDA for 32 years and is now retired, so he can speak freely. Yeah, and the last slide was the attempt by the Yakima congressman, Dan Newhouse, to try to curtail EPA's ability to regulate CAFOs under RCRA. Of course, that's another legislative manure bill because EPA has never tried to regulate CAFOs under RCRA. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to both counsel. The case is submitted.
So uh, with that said, there's a picture of the water program area. Deb had shown you a picture of the dairies earlier. The, those are the colored ones. And so the area with the straight lines on the sides is the area down gradient from the dairies. And people within that area are going to be entitled to free water. So questions, answers, uh, thoughts? Ready to go. <laughs> VGEL organizers, what do you say, five minutes for questions since we're running late? Okay, great. And, and then, Charlie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, great. Could you unshare your screen so that your picture will be bigger? Uh, Don't see. turn off your camera, though. Share my screen. Let's see if this works. Uh, okay, I can see you guys now. Let me get, see if I can get that over there. Nope. Let's try. Is that any better? Um, no, hold on one second. I'm going to make it us. Uh oh. Lost me. We got you. Okay. Can you see us? Yes. Okay. Does everybody have a beer in their hand? I would at 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> Snyder. A little bit of a uh, Vermont Porter, Catamount Porter, maybe. All right, there we go. OK, uh, looks like we have a question from David Mears. So, uh, Justin, uh, wait. So, Charlie, David Mears. I I'm curious. Yeah, I can hear you, David. I'm, I'm curious um, whether, uh, where was and or did the state of Washington Department of Ecology play any role in the midst of this whole this whole round of litigation and this this process? Uh, the role they played was in ignoring the public health and making it easier, or well, I, mean, I guess making it necessary for citizens to do the job, because uh, in 2005. 2006, we challenged the last Department of Ecology permit for CAFOs, which we argued should have required groundwater monitoring for all uh, medium and large CAFOs. And the original draft of the permit from Department of Ecology that came out in 2004 uh, said groundwater monitoring was the only way to know uh, the extent of the problem. That was from their scientists. Uh, the politicians overruled that. Uh, we challenged that and lost that decision in 2006, and now we're here today. Uh, we've known about this problem for a long time, and it's the inaction of uh, the Department of Ecology and EPA that brought us to this point in the first place. Um, we actually, David, also had uh, a great deposition transcript, which is also available on my website, from the regional director um, uh, in the Acoma area, who's a certified hydrogeologist in the state of Washington, who um, agreed with us that the department had been negligent in its duties and that was failing to properly regulate the CAFOs. So what happens is the Washington State Department of Ag is the entity that regulates the dairies in, in Washington. That hasn't always been the case. It used to be ecology. And talk about politics. <clears throat> Ecology is not pleased that they no longer represent or, or regulate, I'm sorry, the dairies and its ag. So this person he's talking about still has a chip on his shoulder that ecology knows better than ag. And that was, he wasn't given a 30B6 deposition. It was just a guy um, not representing ecology, but as an employee of it. So that's who Charlie's talking about. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And the WSDA inspectors that Deb uh, referred to earlier said things like in their recent um, uh, inspections, thank you for your attention to nitrates. Um, so, you know, it, to talk about the politics, the, the head of the Dairy Nutrient Management Program, Ginny Prest, uh, had actually sent the uh, internal uh, non-disclosable draft version of the 2011-2012 permit to the head of the Washington State Dairy Federation and they texted each other some 35 times each each month, met at bars, uh, talk about um, industry in bed with the regulators. This is about as close as it gets. 
Thank you. We have another question. Yeah, uh, Charlie Oliver. Have, first of all, just from the dialogue here, this sounds like a hell of a case. It must have been very interestingly contested. Uh, it was the most contentious case I've ever been involved in, Pat. What sense is that? that something like that is, is in the word. The other question, the, the question is, where's e, where was EPA during the litigation on the RICRA issue? And uh, did they take a position on the application of RICRA? And after the case, have they taken a position on the application of RICRA? Um, the EPA has not, did not ever formally enter our case. Um, the documents that they generated under the AOC uh, became evidence in the case, but uh, no, they never took a formal position. I can tell you we asked, because I can tell you that Again, I didn't represent these dairymen when they were in the negotiations with EPA, but I can tell you that um, my clients very much were under the impression that if they, in fact, entered into these consent orders with the EPA, with these new requirements, that they'd be walking, and these were the words used by the director, hand in hand with them to make sure that all these problems were solved, and that when, when the lawsuit was filed, we asked EPA to come in for us and to either enter into the case or support us with the duplication argument on the motion to dismiss, and they declined. Well, yeah, for, for very good legal reasons. Other questions? Yes. Um, so for Mark and, and Jerry, um, interesting presentation, interesting litigation. Uh, the thought that occurred to me is, if you're fortunate enough to win, uh, you'll create a firestorm in Congress. You know, I can't predict how large, but I would predict with certainty that it'll be quite fairly be characterized as a firestorm. And so I'm curious what your strategy is for dealing with the legislative fallout of your hope for victory. I hope I didn't give the impression that it's my case. Because it's not, I, I support it, obviously, but I'm not, it's not my case. I, I've consulted with them a little bit, but I haven't, it's, I'm, not, I'm not the lawyer involved. Um, but, you know, one of the things that your question brings to mind is that, you know, I think that we're dealing with an act written at a time when, we, we talked about agriculture a lot today, and, and I hope that it doesn't come across as demon, demonizing agriculture because, you know, I come from a farm family and I still got a farm in Kansas. If anyone wants to buy it, I, I can see me afterwards. <laughs> but, um, but it was, you know, the Clean Water Act was written at a time when the family farm was the norm, and now we're dealing with uh, hog lots in Iowa where if you've got, uh, each hog produces four times the amount of manure as a human. So if you've got 5,000 hogs, which is a very typical size in Iowa, that's 20,000, it's the equivalent of a city of 20,000 people, and the manure goes into an earthen lagoon and sits there until they dump it on the, on the farm where it runs off into the water. If you had a city that was doing that, they would have to get a permit and they would be in deep trouble, right? So we're still dealing with agriculture as if it were a couple of cows and a pig, when in fact it's these industrialized operations. And I think Congress needs to wake up and deal with the fact that it's not like it was 40 years ago and that they need to treat it, however they're going to deal with it, they need to treat it as a real source of pollution. Well, I would predict that the week after your victory in the district court that some very small farmer who is affected by this will become the poster child of this cause. Uh, and, and you talk about the fact that this could all be handled by general permits, but what they're going to say is that you're going to apply the NPS permitting program, which is applicable to large industrial operations and mom and pop farms. And you know, I can tell you they're, they're probably a majority, in, 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 there's certainly a majority in the House, and you know, might well be at least 50 votes in the Senate to expand the agricultural exemption to deal with this problem. So, and I, I guess my advice to whoever's right. handling these cases is oh. we've got to think down the line. Well, and, and of course the reaction, you know, and, and believe me, I know that nobody beats the Farm Bureau in terms of their ability to try to influence public opinion and, and legislative opinion. And so the reaction to this lawsuit in Iowa uh, was to start advertising, huge advertising campaign with exactly that um, in mind to, to show family farmers that they were going to be impacted, they were going to be run out of business. 
in my view, ridiculous assertions, but, uh, but that's already, they've already got the machinery cranked up uh, to, make that, to make that argument, which I think is sad, um, instead of just trying to step up and deal with the reality, so. So thank you everyone for sticking around and um, uh, just really enjoying this very interesting panel. I'm gonna hand it over to Jackie now for some closing remarks. Thank you. I know it was a long day, but I think everybody got a lot out of it. Um, for those of you that don't know, VGEL's mission is to provide access an accessible forum to discuss contemporary environmental legal issues, and I think we accomplished that today. So everyone, a round of applause for yourselves. Questions were great. Speakers were great. Um, so Kelsey and I, on behalf of VGEL and the exec board, um, hope that you all enjoyed today and that you walk away with some new insight um, and hopefully some new questions that will help you find even further insight <laughs> um, into a lot of these issues that are gonna keep coming up. Um, we have so many people to thank and I'm sure I'll forget some, but first of all to all of our moderators, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and helping us put this together. Uh, we really appreciate it. To um, our wonderful keynote speakers, Dave Owen and Oliver Houck, really some great, Great takeaways, I think, and, and at least made me think. What about you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we also need to thank uh, Bill Vaughn, who's not here right now. He might be running around, but he helped us set up all the mics, all the projectors, get Charlie in on go to meeting. <laughs> so thanks, Charlie, for sticking around. Um, and we figured it out. And we want to thank Martina, um, the wonderful lunch that you enjoyed. That was all the catering staff here, and they're amazing and really good at what they do. Um, and particularly want to have a special thanks to Pref Professor Parento. We could not have done this, any of this, without you. You held our hand through it. <laughs> you kept us going a little, a little crazy. Um, you kept us in line and you helped us, I think, get a better appreciation for the subject and uh, just for what it takes to put one of these together. So. Thank you. You're Thank you. Thank You're you. <laughs> um, so, on that note, have a great day, guys. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming.